Good morning. I'm very happy to be with you. Thank you for taking some time to listen to my talk. My talk is about uh, two subjects. One is uh, the methodology, how to model for forecasting the production and prices of forest products, not just wood, but also its derivatives from uh, soundwood to wood-based panels to pulp and paper. And the other is an attempt to see with the same methodology, what are the implications of climate change? I have some places to thank for the support that I received. First, uh, my university, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, over the years, I got a lot of support from the U USDA Forest Service. In fact, the presentation that I will give you was supported by the USDA Forest Service. When we look at the effect of uh, climate change on uh, forestry, we have to recognize that climate change has many aspects. It's very complex. So to get a handle on it, we really have to decompose to the basics, try to see what can we understand a really measure of this climate change. One thing that we can measure fairly accurately is the temperature. So what I will be doing is to concentrate on the effect of, of uh, temperature over the long term. Uh, we know from basic chemistry that the photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis, is affected by temperature. When the temperature is very cold, then you get very little photosynthesis, very little growth of trees or any plant. Photosynthesis is the basic formula for all of like life, essentially. And at low temperature, it does not work. As temperature increases, the rate of photo photosynthesis increases. So for trees, it means that the trees are going to grow faster. But up to a point, up to a point which is the optimal temperature for a given species in a given area. After that point, then it's a disaster. Very quickly, the growth crashes. And uh, I would like to show you some of the numbers that I have obtained to show the effect of this change in temperature on the development in the forest sector. Because change in photosynthesis is going to imply differences in the rate of growth of trees and all its consequences. Consequences for wood supply, consequences for the price of wood and its derivative, consequences for the consumption of the product, their production, their international trade, and also consequences for the amount of CO2 that we store in trees in the forest. The methodology that I have used for this project is the Global Forest Product Model, GFPM in short. This uh, picture describes the cover of the book uh, of a rather initial uh, development of the GFPM. It happened at the request of the FAO, which was in trouble at the time because people had retired, Philip Wardell and Stan Printel had uh, retired, and uh, they needed a way to make their long-term uh, global assessment. And they, they contacted us at the University of Wisconsin. We hesitated to say yes, but finally we said yes, because we, could, we thought we could adapt a model that we had previously, a model of the pulp and paper industry that we called the papyrus, 
we thought that we could adapt that model and generalize it to cover the whole forest sector globally. And uh, we did it. We ended up with a model with 180 countries. It was not our choice. At the beginning, I proposed, well, let's work with regions. Let's work with Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America. No, 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 Philippe, uh, 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 Mafach Beta told me. I want the projections by countries. Well, I hesitated for a while, but finally I said yes, and we ended up indeed with a model with 190 individual countries. And for each, we had data on forest area, the stock of, of, of trees in this area, the CO2 stored in those trees, and data on 14 group of products ranging from uh, fuel wood to uh, sand wood, wood-based panels, pulp and paper, uh, paper and paper products. And for each of the products in each of the country, we established data on the production, the consumption, the imports and exports, and the prices, with the hope that we could project those uh, uh, elements over, over time. Since uh, uh, this happened, it was around 1997. Since this happened, there were further development with my students. Some of them were uh, uh, displayed here with uh, their hard work. We updated the, mo the model many times. And the current version is uh, the version with the base year 2020 which includes the most recent data of the FAO, which go up to 2021. What we do to establish the base year, we take the average of 2021, 2020, and 2019. So we, we say this is the base year from which we are going to do the, 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 the forecast. Uh, by the way, the model is free for the taking. If you type my name in uh, Google, you will have access to my website, and you can download the software for the GFPM. If you want to change the model, you can even download the source code. There is a full data set corresponding to the study that I am going to show you, and you are welcome to use it. If you use it for non-profit organization, it's free. If you are at the university or a non-profit, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, giving me a, any money. If, if you do it for a, a for-profit uh, company, let's say, then I am asking you to make a gift to the University of Wisconsin Foundation that will support the scholarship for some students. Thank you. So uh, the, this slide shows the general structure of the model within a particular country. We start from the stock of trees in the forest. From it, we can derive industrial wood or fuel wood. With the industrial wood, we can make sound wood, plywood, particle board, fiber board. Or we can make intermediate products like uh, mechanical pulp and chemical pulp, with which we will make a new print, printing and writing paper, other paper and paperboard. We can also recycle part of those uh, uh, goods and uh, combine with other pulp, produce again more paper and uh, paperboard. The, this uh, flow of products is described mathematically within each one of the countries, of the 180 countries. And what we are trying is to see how this flow moves over time. Uh, there are two phases, what I call two phases in the GFPM. One is the st static phase. The static phase describes the situation of the market, global market, at a particular point in time. And the uh, uh, 
calculation is based on the theory of the social surplus established by Samuelson in 1952. He made the observation that markets operate like an optimization. What markets do is to maximize the social surplus, which is the value of the product symbolized here, minus the cost of production symbolized here, minus the cost of shipping the product from one country to another. That's what markets are, are doing. That was the observation of Samuelson. Subject to the equilibrium condition that supply must balance demand. So everything that is imported of a particular product in a country plus what is made in that country must balance what is consumed in the country plus what is used in making other products, plus what is exported from the country. And that must be true for each country, each one of the 180 countries and 14 uh, product groups that uh, we are considering. It's a beautiful formulation, really. Just two equations that are general enough to cover the entire uh, uh, forest sector. Of course, it will take a lot of work for me of my and my students to get all those parameters, right? The elasticities of demand with respect to price and uh, GDP, for example, and the input-output coefficients, how much round wood you need per unit of sound wood that you are producing, all those data are to be generated so, somehow for all uh, the products and countries. It is also a beautiful formulation because not only through the primal does it give you the quantity produced, consumed, imported, exports, but with a dual solution, which you, you obtain simultaneously in the, in the calculation, with the dual solution, you obtain, obtain the prices, the prices at which the demand is going to balance the, the supply. The calculation is done by a program called BMPD. It's a, an interior point dual uh, uh, programming, prog uh, dual quadratic programming system developed by Xaba Mesoro. He is at the Hungarian Academy of Science. And he was kind enough to give us free again, as long as it was used in the GFPM and not used for other purposes. He gave it to us, which means it's fully integrated and you don't have to spend any money to finance Lindo, uh, who will charge thousands of dollars for an optimization model, for example. So this was the static phase, the calculation of the equilibrium at a particular point in time. It's very fast, 0 0.56 seconds on an ordinary computer, 0 0.56 seconds. It amazes me how, 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 how rapidly the calculation, the calculation is, is done. But once you have done the calculation for a particular year, then you have to project it for the next year. The, the, the program works by iteration from one year to the next. And that dynamic phase, the linking the present to the future condition, takes much more time. In fact, the run of the uh, entire model for 50-year projection takes uh, about half an hour. Uh, there are many conditions in this a dynamic phase, uh, you need to project, for example, what would be the technical change. How much pulp will you need per ton of paper ne next year? It's going to change due to the fact that we, we use more waste paper, for example, instead of using virgin, virgin fiber. So all of that has to be calculated and it takes time. For our purpose, the main equation in the dynamic phase is the equation that establishes the change in forest stock. The inventory in a particular year must be equal to the inventory in last year 
plus the growth of that inventory minus the harvest. Right? Now, the growth must be a function of the change in forest area, so here on one hand, and the change in the rate of uh, growth of the trees on the area that remains. And it is here, in that parameter, that we can introduce the effect of climate, uh, climate change. And that's how we, we are going to do it. We can do it by using some of the data available. In fact, the idea of the project came to me when I read the article by Wei and Oren in Tree Physiology in, in 2010. What they did was to collect masses of data all around the world about how trees are growing at different, temp uh, different temperatures. And they established for those data the equations for boreal forest, temperate forest, and tropical forest, equation that predicts the effect of temperature on the growth of, of trees in that, uh, in that location. And based on those uh, equations, I was able to calculate for different scenarios what will be the effect of the change in temperature only, okay? We forget about anything, like I said at the beginning, we have to concentrate on one element at a time. So here we concentrate on temperature only. And uh, what I was able to establish was the effect of temperature, different level of temperature, according to the scenario. I use the scenario of the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change. There are three of them here. The first one, the B2, which implies a raise uh, in temperature of 2.4 degrees centigrade over 100 years. The A1B, that implies 2.8 degree of temperature over 100 years, and the uh, last one, A2, that implies a 3.4 rise in, the, in temperature. And you see the uh, uh, result based on the equation of, of Way and Oren, the results show a positive response to increase in temperature in the boreal zone, uh, some effect, some positive effect also in temperate zone, but a large negative effect in tropical zone, right? And it is those parameters that we will now introduce in the GFPM to try to f see what are going to be the consequences for the whole sector of this rise in, te in temperature. We have to consider many industries from logging to house construction. I was raised in France, as some of you may know, and you can hear from the, 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 the sound of my voice, the French also, that I am, I am so amazed when I look at the people building houses in the United States with uh, sticks and a, a flake board. I mean, look at that. Uh, all the, the floor made of flake board and structural elements made of uh, flake board too with some solid wood, but not much, uh, not much of it. That's a major sector where wood is uh, utilized in different forms, but there are other sectors. Very important is the pulp and paper industry, which is critical in Wisconsin, for example, where I spent many, many years. So let's see some of the data that we show the effect on those industries of a rise, uh, global rise uh, in temperature. The table shows the impact on wood production, total wood production. That's fuel wood plus industrial run wood. By the way, globally, it's about 50-50. Globally, we consume about the same amount of fuel wood as uh, industrial run wood. But of course, it's different in different regions. In Africa, for example, it's consumption of a lot of fuel wood, very little uh, uh, production of industrial wood. It's exported, what, uh, what is uh, made. In other places like North America, well, little fuel wood consumption and lots of industrial wood consumed. 
So the table shows for two scenarios, these are the extreme scenarios, the B2 and the, and the A2. It shows the impact of the rise in temperature after 50 years. The projection is for 2000, 2070. So we start the simulation in 2020. We introduce the uh, annual rate of increase of temperature, and we observe over 50 years the effect of the rise in, in temperature on production. The data are in million cubic meters of production in the year 2017, and the data show the difference between the simulation with impact of temperature and without. Right? And uh, uh, here are the results for, uh, for countries that have uh, many trees in boreal zones, like Canada, for example. You can see that in 2070, due to climate change, the production will be 10% to 40% higher than without climate change. I mean, I should not even say climate change, I, I, I would say without the increase in temperature. Uh, other places where there will be a strong increase, Russia, 9% impact in 2017 to 14%. 14%. That gives an idea of the ra range of uh, uh, possibilities. Sweden, even, 7% to 11%. France, nothing. Finland, 7% to 11%. So a substantial impact of just this effect of uh, temperature. On the other hand, if you look at zones where, the, at tropical zones, look at Brazil, for example, in South America, there the effect is negative. Right? Minus 5% to minus 8% eight, eight production. Uh, the production is lower by about 5% to 8% eight, uh, eight in 2070 due to the change in, in temperature. If you summarize the data, you can see the difference between the developing and the developed world. The positive impact of the rise in temperature on production in developed country and the negative impact in developed country is almost symmetric. Like I told you, the beauty of the system is that you can get the price effect also. And of course, for an economic point of view, Having the prices is critical. Uh, is critical. Uh, the data, the the chart show the difference in wood prices under scenario B2 and A2. The difference in wood price year by year due to the increase in, te in temperature. In scenario A2, for example. This is the pattern, a decrease in price of about 4 to 5 uh, to 5 uh, percent over 50, uh, 50 year period for industrial round wood. The effect is less important for the more elaborated products like uh, sound wood and, and chemical pulp. In uh, the B2 scenario, the effect on price is practically zero, uh, negligible. When you have the data on uh, quantities, quantity produced, quantity consumed, and the data on price, then you can calculate for the whole sector, the whole industries put, uh, put together, you can calculate an indicator like the value added. The value added is the value of the product, my, the value of all the products produced in the sector, minus the cost of producing, the, uh, producing them. It is the return to capital and labor, if you, if you, if you want. And this is the uh, impact measured in a million, million dollars under the two scenarios, B2 and A2. You see the places where there is a positive impact, about 1.6 billion to 3.3 billion in Canada, for example, 4% to 10%. On the other hand, negative impact, like in, in Brazil, two billions 
to $3 billion minus 4% to 9%. Uh, 9%. That's the reduction in value add in Brazil due to the increase in temperature over 50, 50 years. So it is, it is substantial. Uh, in Indonesia, we have the same pattern of the negative impact. On the other, on the other hand, in Europe, the impact is uh, not that big, but positive, not that big relatively. I mean, in, in billions of dollars, it's, it's subst substantial. If we summarize the data, oh, you may be interested in Sweden, by the way. Here it is. <laughs> Here it is for Sweden, 4% to 2% uh, relative impact. Finland has better, 4% to 6% positive, uh, positive impact. If we summarize the data for all developed in the developing country, we observe again the dissymmetry. The developed country benefiting, their value added increases under the climate change, even under just that dimension, the, the, the temperature impact, and the developing countries suffer. Another thing that we can look at is the amount of uh, carbon that is sto stored in the, in the forest. The picture is black to give this idea that we, we are interested in the carbon that the trees are, are containing. And uh, these are the data. They are in million tons of CO2 equivalent, and it is again the impact in the year 2070, the impact of uh, the change in, uh, in uh, temper temperature. Uh, you can see the negative effect in Brazil, for example, 4% to 6%. In Indonesia, 3% to 5%. On the other hand, the, pos the positive effect, effect. Canada, an increase of 5% to 9%. 9%, Sweden, 2% to, to 5%. Russia is a big one, 8.5 billion uh, ton. Uh, the difference in 15 billion ton difference, 5 to 9%. So, to conclude, we have looked at uh, some of the market effect of uh, temperature change over a long period, half a century. We have observed that the results are very much uh, scenario dependent. You saw the big difference in all the results between the B2 and the A2 scenario. So it depends a lot on the basic assumption that you are making regarding the, the evolution of the economy, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for example. This is why we should think of the results not really in terms of prediction, but in terms of uh, projection. They are conditional, res uh, conditional results. If you assume this, then this is what you have to expect. But the information still, I think, is precious in terms of decision making. Uh, we have observed that the general effect of a rise in temperature will be a lowering of, uh, of the world prices. The world prices are measured by the unit value of exp export. Uh, we observed also the ve very much cont contrast between developed and developing uh, countries, the pattern in general. Developed countries benefiting, developing countries losing. It's the same even for, from CO2 sequ sequestration. We always observe the dichotomy, north versus south. So what can we do about this? Well, I am counting on the young researchers that we have in the room. It's all yours, guys. <laughs> it's all yours. Uh, what, what, uh, what could you do? One thing is to improve the a representation of climate change. We have looked just at this dimension of the change in temperature, but there are many other impacts of climate change, especially catastrophic events, large fires, 
storms which seem to happen more frequently. But what I hope is that you got to get the message that you have the methodology whereby if you can quantify, even just estimate, you don't have to need, you don't need the hard data. If you need uh, have just soft data, what uh, for Jay Forrester calls soft data, that is to say an idea of what the impact will, could be, then you can use a methodology like the, the GFPM or something else, if you prefer, and find out what the economic impact w w will be. Another area that I think would be interesting to look at from the point of policy is this contrast of the North versus the South. That's the general thing that we observe in so many areas of uh, environmental change, the North versus the, the, the South. So could we think of ways of extracting by taxing, or I don't know wh which uh, method that should be studied, of extracting this m value add that we have observed in the northern countries and transfer it to developing countries. Maybe through uh, reforestation projects, for example, or some intervention like, th like that. But again, it's up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. Yes, thank you. Wonderful work. Thank you. Wonderful work. Uh, we, we do have time for some questions, if you want to. Anyone? Birga. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? Yeah. No, but my philosophy, the simpler the better. Simpler. Yes. Yes. Yes, make it as simple as you can so that you can communicate it. And people can observe, make a comments and say, you are crazy, this doesn't work. By the way, those 180 countries that FAO wanted us to do, Chivita, Chivita was fair. No, I want the data by, by country. I bitched about it. I'm sorry, this is on record. <laughs> 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 I, I was upset about it. But... Later, I realized that this was really a very useful constraint. Why? Because at the level of Af Africa or Latin America, you can say any nonsense. Nobody will know about what is Africa, what is Lat Latin America. On the other hand, if you say Algeria, well, it's likely that someone out there is going to know the data for Algeria, or, or at least to have a working knowledge of this. And, and, and that's, uh, that, that's uh, important, I think, to make, uh, to make pro progress. But again, going back, that communication, you will uh, get it at least sim at, at, the initial, uh, uh, at the beginning, it should be as simple as possible, I feel. Oh, no. Yes, and that complexity only if it is absolutely needed. Thank you. And the next question is Anne, and then uh, Antti, and then Tom. Okay. Thank you very much, Joseph. It was extremely inspiring as all of your presentations. We have been happy to hear over the, I don't Thank know, how many decades. Thank you. My question is maybe related to, the, to these parameters that you mentioned, that they are always influential in this type of modeling. So the demand elasticities. Yes. What is your intake on the state of research ongoing about the market modeling? Yeah. at the moment, or, or do you have some suggestions that the future researchers should perhaps uh, focus on? Maybe we should not put too much emphasis on the estimation of parameters. Maybe it's uh, preferable to be bold and to have uh, some result and then 
based on the feedback, observe where the improvement has, has to be made. Is it really the elasticity of demand for plywood, for example, that is critical? Or is it something totally different, like the input-output coefficient for, for a chemical, uh, a chemical pulp? So that's what I, I, will, I will tend to do. Yes. Antti? Thanks. Uh, very inspiring presentation, and I, I loved the uh, beauty of how you presented linear optimization and linking subsequent ye years with each other. Yeah. Uh, in the end of your presentation, you said that um, uh, the adverse impacts of climate change, like large-scale disturbances, are not in the model. Right. So if, if somebody of us or other young researchers would try to do that, would it simply be to adding that impact to the growth yes. parameter yes. Of, of your model? Yes, conceptually yeah. it's very simple. Right. Conceptually it's very simple, you, but you have to get the number so, yeah. somehow. But Tom, after all, you should Tom not hesitate. Uh, some kind of a number must, must, must be out there, out, out there, right? Even if there are no official statistics, I think we can even guess a particular number and then see the, implic the implication. And when you have that number, I think you can introduce it readily, yes, in the modeling structure. Yeah. yeah. Another uh, thing that uh, I think we could uh, uh, look at very easily, and that is critical now, one student should be doing that just today, take a note and, and do it. There is a lot of talk about isolating parts of the forest uh, estate to keep it for conservation purpose. Well, what is going to be the impact on the industry of doing that? I think you can do it very readily with the methodology that, uh, that, uh, that I have uh, presented. Yeah. And someone should do it. Who is going to do it? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, you, it's your flag now to carry, gentlemen and ladies, so you have to do it. Maybe Tom is going to do it then. But <laughs> Tom, no, no, you. That's a lot yeah. of pressure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, I wanted, sort of, actually bouncing off the previous question about disturbances. Um, one of the characteristics of certainly the big disturbances we see in Europe are these kind of gluts of supply that, that come from large amounts of trees being killed. Does this require adjustments in your model to account for this? Is this something that fits into the very simple formulation as you describe it, or would you need to readjust parameters to account for this? You will have to adjust the parameters for sure, yes. Uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, 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 nevertheless, that the methodology, uh, the methodology is more adapted to long-term trends projection rather than short-term fluctua fluctuations. Right. What you have is a general idea of the development that will take, uh, take uh, place. But if you want to make a, a prediction, which I did, unfortunately, recently, I wanted to see what would be the effect of the COVID on the, on the global forest sector. And I made a projection that were lousy. They were terrible. <laughs> yes. yes. So, so I think we should refrain to have that desire of having immediate uh, results. I think the methodology is more adapted to long-term forecasting, long-term trends, yes. That was the last for this. Thank you very much, Joseph. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.